Next on Current News, Catholic determination on display in Coney Island. A center for kids destroyed by Hurricane Sandy is back in business thanks to Catholic charities. Mike Bloomberg is making a move on the White House. The former New York City mayor is getting ready to enter the race. I struggle a lot when I started my new life here. New York City is where the young woman started her new life. Next week, she'll be in front of the Supreme Court arguing for the Dreamers. Plus, Bishop DiMarzio will be here ahead of Veterans Day. He's talking about faith and the military. The news starts right now. Good evening, I'm Emily Druby. Tonight, a center of charity and love is reborn after one of the worst disasters in New York City's history. A Catholic Charities facility for kids in Coney Island is helping them again after being wiped out by Hurricane Sandy. It's not just a building. Well, come with me. One, two. It's a place for kids to grow, a place that lifts parents' financial burden, and a place that shows just how far Coney Island has come since Hurricane Sandy. After breaking ground in 2015, yeah. the Charles Murphy Early Childhood Development Center is officially open, a state-of-the-art center providing free, top-notch schooling for low-income families. Very rewarding to now be at the point that we actually have children upstairs in the classrooms. The former center was destroyed seven years ago by Superstorm Sandy. Locals say the loss was a major blow to the community. It was a major impact because I knew the kids would have to travel more, but to know that they're recovering so fast lets us know that they care about the community and the kids because the kids are our future. The storm devastated New York, claiming the lives of 43 people, affecting 90,000 buildings and causing $19 billion in damage. Underfunding and scheduling issues causing the recovering effort to be especially difficult in areas like Coney Island, making the reopening of this Catholic Charities of Brooklyn and Queens facility extra special. To me, it is a beacon of hope, not just for the community, but also for others in various communities that was devastated by Sandy, that though we have been knocked down, but we were able to build ourselves up. Desiree Jackson Fryson of Catholic Charity says new, stronger construction helps protect the facility from future storms. But in most of the neighborhoods, many flooding prevention projects are uncompleted. With so much still to be done, Mark Traeger, the district's city councilman, is proud of the center reopening. We're not at the finish line yet, but this is a significant step forward, and this is a significant day. A beacon of hope for both the neighborhood and for the families that rely on their services. Sandy ranks as one of the worst natural disasters ever to cripple New York. Seven years later, many homeowners are still struggling to get back on their feet. More than 10,000 people dropped out of a city-run program to rebuild their homes, claiming too much red tape. Since then, reforms have been put in place, and those remaining in the Build It Back operation have gotten assistance. Overall, the East Coast suffered more than $70 billion in damage. The latest now from Capitol Hill in the battle over impeachment. A key player at the White House ignored a subpoena today, and President Trump is still blasting the probe. Daryl Forges reports from Washington. With public hearings and the impeachment investigation just days away, House Democrats are releasing the transcripts from the depositions of key witnesses. Top White House Ukraine expert Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Vindman says the hold on military aid to Ukraine, quote, came from the chief of staff's office, adding the reason was to ensure the assistance aligned with administration priorities. The acting chief of staff, Mick Mulvaney, failed to appear at a scheduled deposition on Friday. We wanted to hear whether he made the decision to withhold the aid or did the president order him to withhold the aid. Speaking from the White House last month, Mulvaney confirmed Trump froze nearly $400 million in U.S. aid to Ukraine. He said it was done in part to pressure the country into investigating Democrats. He later denied admitting the quid pro quo. Uh, the reality is that Republicans are trying to pin this on Mulvaney, arguing that the president may not have been involved. I don't believe that, but Mulvaney could clarify the president's role. 
Mulvaney's lawyer says the White House directed his client not to be there, adding to a list of White House officials who defied subpoenas. I don't want to give credibility to a corrupt witch hunt. President Trump continues to deny any wrongdoing as he and lawmakers prepare for public hearings next week. Daryl Forges, Currents News. A new investigation of military aid to Ukraine is being launched by the government's top watchdog. The freeze on the funds is at the center of the impeachment battle. President Trump is accused of pressuring Ukraine's leader to investigate Joe Biden and his son before the money would be released. The GAO, the Government Accountability Office, wants to learn if the administration violated the law by holding back the aid. Tonight, Mike Bloomberg is making a move that could really shake up the Democratic field running to replace President Trump. New York's former mayor is actively preparing to get on the ballot. Christina Alishi reports. Billionaire businessman and former New York Mayor Michael Bloomberg will file necessary paperwork to get on the Democratic primary ballot in Alabama. That's despite suggesting earlier this year that he was ruling out a presidential run. When you look at the layout of who's going to vote and where the country is, mm -hmm. I would be very unlikely to get reelected, to get elected. Uh, but in the private sector, I can make a difference. While Bloomberg is filing now to meet the state's early deadline, he has yet to make a final decision on entering the race. He's a phenomenal entrepreneur and businessman. I will say that I think it'd be very tough for someone to jump into the race at this point in time. A person familiar with Bloomberg's thinking says he's reconsidering the run because of his longtime adversary, President Trump. I'm a New Yorker, and I know a con when I see one. Bloomberg is concerned that the Democrats in the race can't defeat the president. Progressive Democratic candidates speaking out against the potential rival, who Forbes says is worth about $52 billion. Senator Sanders' campaign manager lashing out at Bloomberg stating more billionaires seeking more political power surely isn't the change America needs. It's not enough just to have somebody come in, anybody, and say they're going to buy this election. Senator Warren also tweeting out her tax calculator for billionaires. Under Warren's tax plan, it figures Bloomberg would pay over $3 billion. That was Christina Alishi reporting. President Trump is saying he's known fellow New Yorker Mike Bloomberg for a long time, but Trump's not worried about a Bloomberg run. He's not going to do well, but I think he's going to hurt Biden, actually. But he doesn't have the magic to do well. Uh, little Michael will fail. But a Trump campaign source is saying the multi-billionaire Bloomberg could pose a threat to the president's re-election. The president's former attorney general, Jeff Sessions, is running to be Alabama senator again. He quit that job three years ago to join the White House. He had a rocky relationship with Trump. Still in his campaign announcement, Sessions is saying he backs the president. Have I said a cross word about our president? Not one time. And I'll tell you why. First, that would be dishonorable. I was there to serve his agenda, not mine. Second, the president's doing a great job for America and Alabama, and he has my strong support. Now if Sessions wins the Republican nomination, he'll challenge incumbent Senator Doug Jones. A big political battle and the future of the Dreamers is in the hands of the U.S. Supreme Court. The nine justices will hear oral arguments Tuesday on DACA. The program covers about 800,000 undocumented young people brought into the country by their parents. The Dreamers are protected from deportation and allowed to work. A woman living in New York City is one of the plaintiffs. Camila Bernal reports. It's been about 18 years since Carolina Pumfeng arrived in New York from Costa Rica. She was 12 when her parents sent her to the U.S. alone to live with her aunt. I struggled a lot when I started my new life here. I remember crying all the time when I was in school. She learned English, learned how to ride the subway, and excelled in school. And it wasn't until I was about to graduate middle school and I was getting all these scholarships that I couldn't accept scholarships because of my immigration status. Then in 2012, she learned about DACA. She hesitated but eventually applied and got her approval. But everything changed in September 2017. It's DACA. When the Trump administration announced it would end the Obama-era program 
and Fung Feng took to the streets. Just shouting out like all my anger and frustration. That passion caught the attention of the attorneys involved in a DACA case that has now reached the Supreme Court. On November 12, she will stand in front of the nine justices and is aware that not everyone will be on her side. In my opinion, it was an unconstitutional move by President Obama. Genaro Pedro Arias of the Republican National Hispanic Assembly believes it's an issue that needs to be solved by Congress, not the courts. If it's struck down, I hope that the good that comes out of it is that both sides uh, of the aisle need to get together and say, OK, well, look, we have this problem now. It's been settled by the courts. Let's let's sit at the table and come up with meaningful legislation to address the issue instead of, again, kicking the can down the road. Fung Feng also wants a permanent solution. I call New York my home now. I didn't in the beginning, but now I do. After going through all these hardships, I think, like, I don't see myself anywhere else. In New York, I'm Camila Bernal. 30 years after the Berlin Wall fell, one of the heroes who made the great event happen is being honored. Oh. A statue of President Ronald Reagan was unveiled in the city Friday night by Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. Reagan and St. John Paul II are credited with bringing about the downfall of the Soviet Empire. Stay right here for stories that are only on Currents News. The church will be the state's largest ever, and it is dedicated to an American-born priest who made history. In time for honoring America's heroes on Veterans Day, Bishop DiMarzio is moments away tonight. He's looking at the military and faith. The latest on the Pope's meetings with America's bishops, they're talking about the role of women in the church. Do you have a story idea or want to share a tip? Email us at newstips at desalesmedia.org or call our 24-hour number 718-517-3122. We'll be right back. A joyous groundbreaking has launched the construction of the largest Catholic church ever in Oklahoma. It's going to be a shrine to a priest who also made history. Blessed Stanley Rother, the first U.S.-born martyr to be beatified, the holy man lost his life in Guatemala's brutal civil war while bringing the faith to the people. Patrina Adger reports from Oklahoma City. It's a day Catholic faithfuls have been praying for, a shrine honoring Blessed Stanley Rother. Archbishop Paul Coakley and bishops from across Oklahoma here for this historic groundbreaking of the multi-million dollar church and shrine in Rother's honor. Que todos los aquí presentes. More than 1,200 people from across the state, some coming from Mexico, to celebrate the Oklahoma-born priest. Rother, killed in his church in Guatemala in 1981, later becoming the first U.S.-born priest and first U.S. martyr to be beatified. But it's certainly a dream fulfilled, uh, a next step forward in the development of this beautiful shrine. Archbishop Coakley says once finished, this will be the largest Catholic church in Oklahoma, seating more than 2,000 people. We needed a church to serve uh, a growing uh, Latino, Hispanic population, which was concentrated uh, largely on the south side of the city. Maria Delora was born in Mexico and knows the Rother family and says this church is a long time coming. We're going to have people from all over the world coming here. We are so blessed and um, it's going to be amazing. That was Patrina Adger reporting. The shrine to Father Rother is expected to be completed in two years. Another Catholic building project is already finished, and for a very good reason. Vocations are surging in the Archdiocese of Cincinnati, and the seminary needed more room. A new building has been dedicated named Fenwick Hall after the first bishop of Cincinnati. The facility will help house the 90 young men who are currently studying to enter the priesthood. That's nearly three times the number of men enrolled just nine years ago. Fenwick Hall will add 30 residences plus a number of classrooms and conference spaces. Veterans Day is Monday, the time to honor and remember America's heroes. Bishop DiMarzio is with Ed Wilkinson to discuss the connection between the military and faith and to highlight the men who keep it strong. Ed. 
Thank you, and Veterans Day weekend is uh, here. And Bishop, we want to talk a little bit about the role of military chaplains uh, in the armed forces today. You know, first of all, what is the role of having a, a chaplain in the armed forces? Well, the chaplain service has been almost from the beginning of our military, from the Civil War on, uh, because men uh, in the service, and now many women, need the services of a priest or a chaplain of their own uh, religious uh, adherence. Uh, because uh, th th they need it. And this, this is why the Army uh, is able to, um, actually they pay for the chaplains so that uh, they can be of assistance to the men and women. Mm -hmm. uh, if a fellow comes to you, uh, first, first of all, whose decision is that? Is it the priest's decision? Is it the diocese's decision? Do you appoint them or do they? Uh, well, do they normally it would be the priest that is, expresses an interest in serving in the military. Mm -hmm. And then he would go to the military archdiocese and they would uh, look at him and see if they think he's acceptable. And then I'd have to get my permission for him to go into service. Right now we have uh, three priests working in, in um, the military services. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, so we really do have uh, What some do they commitment. say to you when they come to you and sit down with you for their reasons for wanting to do this? Well, I guess the reasons are varied. You know, some of them have had some military background, been in the military. Um, they're, they're very different reasons. Mm -hmm. It's hard to say. The people, people sometimes will get confused and say, well, we're glorifying the uh, war and violence by putting uh, chaplains into these roles. How do we, how do we stay well, away from that? I don't think you're glorifying anything. I mean, you're, you're, you, these are service, uh, servants uh, of, the, of the men. They're there for the sacramental ministry, for counseling at, at times. So, um, no, it's really um, not in any way saying we, we believe in military uh, militarism, yeah, but I think you know you do have an army. You, you need an army, um, but they also need to have spiritual help. Mm -hmm. And what is the term of service? They could stay there quite a while, can't they? Well, some of them will make a, say a career out of it. They would stay the whole twenty years or or even longer, uh, and others might stay for five, ten years and then come home again. Mm -hmm. How do you stay in touch with them? And they uh, they're still diocesan the priests. Yeah. Right? We, we, they get most of our information as everybody else does and you know they're on the Christmas um, list and the birthday list and so we would uh, be in communication with them then when they come home most of them would come in and say say hello mm -hmm. what are the what would you say are the qualifications that would make somebody a good military chaplain well they need to have discipline because they're in the army it's a place of discipline they just can't do whatever they want they have certain responsibilities. I think in a parish is a little bit a little laxer. They could do have set their own schedules. But in the military they have to follow the regime that's there. They have, you know, real responsibilities regarding the liturgy, being in different places, uh, uh, organizing the catechesis of the children, especially if they're on a base where uh, they have to catechize the children. They have to do the same thing as a pastor. They're basically a pastor, especially when they're on a base. When they're on a ship it's a little different situation in the Navy. Or on the front lines, uh, you know, in, in war zones. So every, it it changes. The role changes mm -hmm. with regard to the circumstances. Yeah. Do you encourage guys to do this? I would not discourage them. I, I don't pick people out and say you should go to the army. You know, yeah. I don't I don't do that. But anybody who comes, I I never uh, discourage them. I think that's it's a very important. The a scarcity of of Catholic chaplains in the military. So. If anybody wishes to do it, I'm more than happy to release them. Yeah, we have a an army base right here in our diocese, you know, down in yeah. uh, Fort Hamilton. There, do we service them, or do they have their own chaplain? Well, they what they they call um, supply men. They would ask people in the di diocese to say mass. I think St. Patrick's Parish does have a mass there once a week mm -hmm. uh, for the people there. But uh, they they don't. There's not enough priests to have somebody stationed full time there. Yeah. It's not that. Yeah. Good. Bishop, thanks so much okay. for your insights on this. And going back to the news desk. Thank you, Ed and Bishop DiMarzio. Monday's Veterans Day Parade in New York City will include something that's never been done before. President Donald Trump will be the first commander in chief ever to lead the march. He's going to be speaking to the vets and will lay a wreath at the Eternal Light Memorial in Madison Square Park. Trump has been a longtime supporter of the parade, raising money for the event years ago. 
An update tonight on the American bishops meeting with Pope Francis at the Vatican. The first group there, the bishops from New England, are reporting on their two-hour session with the Holy Father. Boston's Auxiliary Bishop Robert Reed is saying the conversation highlighted the roles of women in the church and ways to give them more decision-making power. They also talked about immigration and several other important issues. Next week, Bishop DiMarzio will lead Brooklyn's bishops when they sit down with the Holy Father to report on the church in the diocese. These meetings are a big deal, happening once every five years. There's another big event on the U.S. Bishop's calendar, the National Summit, to be held in Baltimore. Protecting young and vulnerable people from abuse and the political responsibility of Catholics are topping the agenda. You can count on Currents News for comprehensive coverage of both the Brooklyn Bishops with the Pope and the U.S. Summit meeting starting on Monday. A spokesperson for the U.S. Bishops Conference is calling a new book about American bishops and the Pope false and misleading. The volume is titled Wounded Shepherd, written by Catholic author Austin Ivory. In it, he examines some of the major events of the Francis Papacy. In one section, Ivory writes the U.S. bishops wanted to, quote, confront the Pope with a fait accompli and pass new rules for handling sex abuse that the Vatican had not seen first. The chief spokesperson for the bishops James Rogers is saying the book perpetuates an unfortunate and inaccurate myth that the Holy Father finds resistance among leadership and the staff of the U.S. Bishops Conference. This is false and misleading. Ivory is responding, saying the bishop's statement doesn't dispute the facts on which he relies. Still to come on Currents News, they've been rescued from a death sentence. Now the dogs are becoming inmates' best friends. We The Japanese church is releasing the official theme song for the Pope's visit that's only days away. Hours before they were set to receive a death sentence, a group of shelter dogs is getting a second chance at life. They're joining inmates at this California prison. They'll live together in a program that officials hope will soften the hearts of the criminals. The older canines will be cared for by the inmates, while the pups will be trained as service dogs or be adopted. It's a program that many are hailing as a gift from man's best friend. I feel like a kid again. Take us back to, uh, you know, humanity. It's great. It's a great feeling right now. I've never seen so many smiles in, in uh, this prison. So far, there are 10 dogs involved in the Pause for Life program, and more are expected. Finally tonight, the Holy Father is making the protection of life the main focus of his upcoming journey to Japan. Highlighting that message is the official theme song, now out two weeks ahead of the Pope's trip. It's titled, Protect All Life. To listen to the full song, visit the official website of the papal trip, Pope in Japan 2019.jp. The Holy Father will be in Japan starting November 23rd, three days after he visits Thailand. That is Currents News. I'm Emily Druby. Thank you for joining us because we are putting your faith in the news. Hope to see you again next time.